So, next one up is Johan with the Java and Dockers and the Internet of Things. Take it. Okay, thank you. Nice to see so many of you show up. I hope you don't expect me to show any Lego trains because actually they're not here anymore. So if you want to leave, you can still do it, but... <laughs> okay, so what's the agenda for the next half an hour? Again, if you have any questions, feel free to just interrupt me in between and I'll try to answer your questions immediately. Uh, by the way, I don't have Lego trains, but I brought my Raspberry Pi, so that's a little bit. Um, so, but Internet of Things, I mean, probably all of you already heard of it. It's connected devices everywhere. It's gaining lots of popularity and all the big companies are investing heavily now in it. Um, but outside of the Internet of Things, lots has happened as well in the last couple of years, mainly on the, on the parts of continuous delivery, using virtual machines, provisioning systems, doing infrastructure as code, etc. Um, but what should we actually deliver? I mean, in the beginning of continuous delivery, we delivered like applications. So we continuously deployed a WAR file on an application server that was already running, and we just replaced the WAR file more or less. And that's a nice beginning to start with continuous delivery. Um, but in the end, I mean, the other parts of your system, they can change as well. People can make manual adjustments to it. So the for me, the ideal of continuous delivery is to roll out the complete environment every time again. So the application server and, and everything that's deployed for, uh, on your system. Um, and it would be really cool if we could do the same on um, hardware for IoT that's a bit more restricted than the big servers where we normally work on. And actually, you can do that maybe even with virtual machines, but they're really heavy. So that doesn't really work on things like a Raspberry. Uh, but luckily, there's Docker. Who of you have heard of Docker before? Please raise your hand. Okay. Who is using Docker already? Ah, quite some people. Nice. Um, so for who are uh, for the people that are not really into Docker yet, so wh what is Docker actually doing? It is trying to solve an issue, and it's trying to solve the issue that. Uh, they refer normally to like shipping containers. So if you have a shipping container, uh, in the early days they didn't have shipping containers, so then they had like a piano and bricks, and if you wanted to transport them, you couldn't do the bricks on top of the piano, of course. Or maybe it would be a good idea to get rid of the piano, but um, if you wanted to keep it, you had to separate it somehow. And with containers you can separate like the load uh, or the, the goods that you want to transport in different containers and then put them on one ship or you could put the same container on a train or a truck. And it's the same for software. I mean, we have lots of different kinds of software, and maybe one day we want to deploy it on our laptop because we're developing there. The next day, maybe we want to deploy it on a server which is inside of our company, and maybe later we even want to publish it in a public cloud for Amazon or Microsoft or whichever vendor. And Docker is a solution for that. So with Docker is like the, sh the shipping container which we had for our goods before. We can now use Docker to package our software so that we can deploy it everywhere. Um, so once you have a Docker container on your, on your laptop, you can deploy that same Docker container on a server as well. One small remark there, it is a bit hardware restricted. So if you um, are using, for instance, a Raspberry Pi that has an RM processor, you cannot run an image that is built on a a laptop on an RM processor, unless your laptop also has an RM processor. So that's something to keep in mind. Normally you could just use the same image unless you use a different hardware structure underneath. Um, but yeah, why would we use Docker? It has certain advantages, especially I think um, compared to virtual machines as we will see in, uh, in the next few slides as well. So for virtual machines, you normally package the complete guest OS with it. So if you have a couple of versions of an application, you end up with lots of disk space because for every virtual machine, it's like 10, 20 gigabytes, uh, gigabytes of disk space. And if you have a new version and again, 10, 20 gigabytes, it's adding up a lot. And with a Raspberry Pi, that's not really going to work. And the nice thing of Docker is that it's a few layers on top. So you have the Docker engine and then it's just a small package that is being deployed. And it's not only smaller, but it's also quicker, because we no longer have a hypervisor that is doing all kinds of translations. We can almost access the Linux kernel features directly. 
and that makes sure that the performance we're getting with Docker is really close to bare metal performance. Um, IBM did some studies on it and th they compared virtual machines with Docker and bare metal and for Docker there's almost no overhead anymore. So you also make a lot more efficient use of the hardware that you have because with virtual machines you lose like 10% of your hardware more or less. Um, so, so these are a couple of uh, advantages. Um, also, for instance, with versioning, it's it's really easy with Docker because the Docker images you can store them in like a, a Git-like repository, as I will show you, uh, so that only the changes are stored every time. And with a virtual machine, you more or less store everything every time. And with Docker, you only need to store the changes compared to the last version that you built. And of course, I mean, on a Raspberry, you cannot even run um, Docker um, virtual machines. Um, yeah, is it difficult to get Docker up and running? Um, not really, I mean, you can just use Arc Linux on a Raspberry, then it's really easy from the beginning. This already works for a couple of years. Um, it's, it's a default package that you can install, and I believe in the newest version of Raspbian, it's also a default package that you can just install and then get up and running. And then the only thing to get like a simple Docker container up and running is do this. And this actually is a specific image that is made for RRM processors so to make sure it works on a Raspberry. And this makes sure that it's interactive and running in a terminal. So you end up in like this image in the bash shell. So you more or less start like a new container and that's running and you end up in the bash shell of that container. And that's quite nice. Then you can start playing with it and install software or whatever you want. Um, but if you want to do it like on, an, on a nice way, um, normally Docker files are used. And Docker files is like a description of what you want inside your container. So here, we again describe, okay, I want this as a base image, and then the steps below are just executed on top of that base image. And as you can see here, it's just Linux operating system commands. So here we install Java, and if you know a bit of, of Linux, you can easily use these commands, and else you can Google for it, because there are lots of examples for this already. Um, so we can set some environment variables, and down here we can see that a port is exposed, so we're running an application server inside the container and we need to expose the ports from the inside of the container to the host operating system. So in this case, we want to expose port 8080 so we can access the web application we're going to deploy. And the last command is simply a command to start Tomcat um, so that our application can start running. Um, I mean, now we have a simple Tomcat Docker file, but there's no app in it. So it's, it's just simple Tomcat itself. Um, yeah, which isn't doing a lot, of course. So we want to get our application inside it. And I could have done that in the same Docker file, just adding the application. Uh, but you can also choose to stack Docker files. It's a bit like inheritance. You just create one Docker file and an image is created out of that. And that image can then be reused to create an another Docker file. So as we can see here, I specify from Tomcat. And that more or less is the image that's created by this Docker file. In a few seconds, I will also sh uh, show you the commands for it. And in here, I just add the WAR file to the Tomcat directory, and that makes sure that the new application is deployed. And because we specified down here already that we wanted to start Tomcat, the application is also automatically being deployed because Tomcat is already running. Uh, so then you have a structure like this. So we, we have the Tomcat directory with the Docker file. This basically is the Docker file where Java is installed, Tomcat is installed, and then we have the Tomcat app directory with another Docker file, and there is where we add the Docker file or the, the WAR file from our application uh, to the container, and that, that's this WAR file. So it's actually quite easy setup. You can keep on extending and stacking containers as often as you want. So for instance, Docker uses a cache, so normally this one with only Tomcat, you don't need to rebuild it anymore because you don't change Tomcat every day. But this one, your application will probably change every day. So if you do a new deployment, you can choose to just update this one and leave this one intact because there's no change in it. So that's an advantage of using inheritance and some parts can just stay the same and other parts you can simply change. Okay, so after we have created some of the Docker files in the Tomcat directory, we simply say, okay, build the Docker file and give it the name Tomcat, so that we, uh, if we go back, can reference it here in the, in the other one. 
And as I show here, it's optional, so you don't need to do this every time. As if it's built once and you haven't changed Tomcat or Java, uh, you don't have to execute these commands. And then at the bottom, we say, okay, now build the Tomcat app as well. Uh, and give it the name Tomcat app. And if we don't then want to start it, uh, we simply run it. And then we can say, okay, we run it and we define a port. So the port inside the container was 8080. We exposed that one in the Docker file. And we can then here choose a different port to map it in the host. Um, why would you want to use in a different port? Uh, for instance, if you want to run maybe multiple versions of the same application, so with the same Docker file, they all have port 8080 exposed. But you, if you want to run them at the same time, you could specify different ports here. So you only need to change the run command to be able to run different Tomcat instances with the same Docker file. Um, so this way we can, can easily start one. Okay, let's show a small demo of it. <coughs> so I have a really basic application here. I, I hope you can read it, I can make it a bit bigger. So it's really just hello world, more or less. Um, and if we now, we want to change that because we're not in the Netherlands at the moment. So we say it's from Croatia. Um, and I've created a small deploy script within Jenkins, um, which I can also show you. So what this basically is doing is uh, here it's just, oh wait, let's make it a bit bigger. Here it's just creating the WAR file again to make sure that the newest version of, of the application is available. Here we copy some files into the Jenkins directory, um, mainly the WAR file and some configuration files like the ones I sh uh, showed you before uh, for the Docker files and stuff like that. Um, normally you would only have to copy it once, but for a demo it doesn't really matter if the files are copied over and over again. Um, and then I use a plugin for uh, Jenkins, which is called um, Publish over SSH. And with that, you can easily transfer files from my, in this case, my laptop to the Raspberry Pi. So what we see here is all the files within Jenkins Pi files are transferred to the Raspberry Pi in the Docker directory. So that way, you have an, a nice way of uh, copying files. And uh, the Raspberry, this is the name of the, um, of the Raspberry Pi. And in the configuration of Jenkins, we specify on which IP address it is running and which username and which password should be used for it. And down below, here we say just, okay, stop every container, uh, build the Tomcat app container again, and run that one. So this is simply a way of, of redeploying an app. And if we now look, this is on the Raspberry Pi. And we see here now it's up about a minute. We can see here, the port mapping, uh, in this case, it's just from 8080 to 8080. Uh, we've only got one running. And we can see if it's already up and running by just looking at the logging of the container. So this basically gets all the uh, system out and system error logging from within the container. Um, and we can see here it has been started up in about 70 seconds. Raspberry Pi isn't that quick. And now, hopefully, we should see something else. Croatia. <laughs> so to show you, it's really in the Docker file here. We can also see that the supplied value was Javantura. So it actually went through the Docker file on the Raspberry Pi. So this is really easy. If you, of course, this is just a simple application, but if you have like a more advanced application that you want to deploy and maybe hundreds of Raspberry Pis, then this is an easy way to make sure that it's deployed at once. Um, so what I did here was a little bit cheating as well. So what I do, I'm just building the Docker, or, or I use the Docker file to create a Docker image and then a Docker container on the Raspberry Pi. Um, but if you're in an enterprise, you don't want to do that. You want to have a centralized place where you create the images from the Docker files. And then every machine should just pull those images and then start a container out of the image. And that's shown in this picture, which is a little bit vague. But here you have a Docker file. Uh, we build it, so an image is created of it. 
we push that image to a Docker uh, container image registry. And this is what I told you before. It's like a Git registry. So only the changes in the Docker image are stored there. And then on every other machine, we can just pull the image out of the Docker registry and then start running it. And that's way, um, f for instance, if I had more Raspberry Pis and I would run uh, the same, or I would build the Docker file on every Raspberry Pi, and I had a statement like, update my machine at the start of the Docker file, and I would execute it on one Raspberry on Monday and on the other Raspberry maybe on Tuesday or Wednesday, then maybe there are already new updates for Linux that are being installed on the one that you update on Wednesday. Um, but if you use a Docker image res registry, you know for sure that exactly the same thing is deployed on all the servers. So that's an uh, uh, important thing to remember. Um, and it's not difficult at all. I mean, creating a Docker registry is just creating a Docker container. And this is the only command you need to set up a simple registry. Of course, then you don't have any advanced security or anything like that. But it's a nice way to get started with Docker uh, registries. And then, um, what we can do, it looks really like Git. So we commit the newest version. Uh, we get an ID that we push that to the Docker registry. So this is the, the Docker registry is running on this port, on this IP address. And then on the other machine, we can simply say, okay, pull the latest version of the image and then run it. And you can see that even the hash value is the same on both machines. It's just the same stuff that you're running on multiple machines. And that makes it really nice to make sure that exactly the same thing is running and not something that's slightly different because with continuous delivery it's important that you deploy the same thing because else you get strange issues uh, nevertheless. Um, so if we update containers only like the changes are stored. So changes in the application or changes in the binaries are stored in a container image registry and if we on another machine want to update the changes we simply do update and we only get the differences. So again, we don't have to download an entire virtual machine, we only download differences. So in my example, only the WAR file will probably differ. So that's more or less the only thing that will be downloaded from the Docker image registry every time. So that makes it really efficient. Um, and here is an example of it. So here we have version, uh, on one machine we have the, the images so they're like 194 megabyte. Then we download the latest version, and we can see uh, this is the latest version, so FF7. And we can see here FF7 is depending on this image, so it's more or less a diff, a diff between those, those two. And we can see it's less than a megabyte of changes because I only changed a small thing. And that makes it really helpful to yeah, get updates around in your network. Um, and the same goes if you have like lots of containers. So what we did, not only on the Raspberry Pi, but we created a, a build environment and a DTAP environment for another project. And then we wanted to figure out, okay, how much work is this and how much data will it cost? So what we did is we created a general base. So this one has, I think it has Java in it. And then uh, this one extends more or less from general base, the same way as the Tomcat app extended from the Tomcat image. Uh, and the same for these ones. Uh, the app server base added Tomcat to the general base and then environments, they contain some environment specific stuff. Jenkins data container is um, because within Docker the idea is to isolate everything. Th so not put everything into one container but every application in a separate container. And not only every application but you should also separate the data. So that if you want to update the application you can still use the old uh, data container, you only need to update the application. For instance, with Jenkins, if there's a new version, uh, you just want to update Jenkins. The jobs that you configured, you just want to keep the same jobs in your new Jenkins version. So that's a best practice, but we were a little bit lazy, so we only did it for Jenkins and not for the other ones, but if you do this in production, probably you want to do this for every, uh, every container that you have. Um, and then it looks like this. So what we see here, is that we need like 900 megabytes to have all those images in a repository. And then, I mean, that's including Java, Tomcat, Sonar, Gitblit, Nexus, Jenkins, everything. Um, 
We cheated a little bit, so not all Jenkins plugins were in here already, but I think it gives a good impression of uh, how less disk space you need to set up stuff like this, um, which makes, makes it really helpful, a lot better than virtual machines. Uh, and the nice thing is to build all of this or download everything and then build everything and start it, uh, it took me on my laptop a little bit over four minutes, and that was mainly because I had a 30 megabit uh, internet line at my home. If I had a quicker line, it would probably be even quicker than that. So to create a complete DTAP environment and a build environment, I was done within five minutes. I mean, try that with virtual machines. Probably you haven't even downloaded one of them. Um, so for a summary, I, I think Docker has a really uh, nice business potential within the IoT and together with Java or yeah, you could use other languages inside it as well, but I mean, of course Java would be uh, our choice. Um, it's quite easy to use. We had this project with colleagues where we had a DTAP environment running on Tomcat and one of the colleagues who never worked with Docker was like, ah, I want to try JBoss as an application server and he managed to change the complete DTAP environment within a couple of hours without having any Docker experience. So it's, it's quite an easy tool. Uh, I've also worked with tools like Chef and Puppet and they work quite nice until you need to change something that isn't really standard. Then it will often cost you a lot of time to figure out how it's working. And with Docker that's a lot more intuitive uh, according to me at least. And it's highly flexible. I mean, you can do with it whatever you want. Create few containers, create a lot of containers, or uh, whatever. And to come back to the isolation, why is isolation important? Because that's the cornerstone of Docker, more or less. I mean, in the beginning, if you have shared resources, it still goes okay. People still play with those resources, and, and they get along well. But after a while, people get fighting over the resources, and yeah, it ends up badly. You have to put people in isolation, because... If you don't they do that, it, it will get violent and they, they might end up in here. <laughs> so keep in mind, it's important to use uh, isolation and, and Docker is a nice solution for that. So, any questions? Thank you.